Good evening. Uh, we're ready to start. I apologize for being uh, 11 minutes late. Uh, if I could have everyone's attention, uh, members of the committee, uh, staff. Uh, good evening, colleagues and audience members. My name is Ed Reising. I am the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. We are here this morning to conduct the second of seven public hearings in the community on City Council Bill 12 0152. This is Transform Baltimore Zoning. Today's hearing will address Title 7 and 8 uh, open space environmental districts, also detached and semi detached residential districts. This comprehensive zoning code rewrite is very important time to learn about the general public's land use and zoning priorities. We want to hear from as many of our constituents as possible. Every hearing is open to public testimony, and citizens may come and provide testimony at each public hearing. The following guidelines, however, will be enforced today and throughout the process. Persons wishing to offer all testimony must sign in and state their name, address, or community in which they reside and who they represent on the record. Individuals offering testimony will be limited to a single three-minute presentation. The screen behind me will assist you with the keeping track of your time. If multiple people from an organization or affiliated group are present, one representative should be designated to speak on behalf of that organization or group. Individuals may not sign in to testify and then yield their time to another person. As stated previously, all individuals will be permitted to test testify only once. If the individual has points they wish to raise that cannot be addressed in the allotted three-minute time period, they can submit written testimony to the committee at the hearing. If you would like to attend a hearing to testify about a part of the zoning code ordinance other than the sections the committee attends to study during that hearing, you may do so and your testimony will be taken during the hearing. If you wish to provide written testimony, please mail it to the Office of Council Services, attention to Antoine Banks at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202, or email at antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov. After the hearing, Antoine will be here. If you need that, that information is his, um, for Antoine, he'll be here to give it to you. Um, also, um, I ask my council members and any, uh, my colleagues on the chair, on the committee, and also other council members that if you have any amendments, please submit them to um, either Antoine Banks or to, to Avery Eisenstark with your amendments. Um, regards to ground rules, I, I request that you please uh, turn off for uh, your uh, cell phones, iPhones, um, for their, to give respect and courtesy to those who are going to testify today. Uh, we will start, we, um, we are joined uh, to my left, far left, um, Councilman Brandon Scott. Uh, to his right is Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. To her right is our Councilwoman Ricky Spector. To my left is the uh, Vice Chair of the Committee, Councilman James Kraft. Uh, to my far right is Councilman Bill Henry. To his left is Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton. We also jo joined by, um, we have um, God, uh, Andy Smallin from the Mayor's Office. Um, also, we have, uh, we have um, Michelle Wurstberger from President Jack Young's office. Also, Kara Kuntz from President Jack Young's office. Uh, Aaron Rowe is here. He is an intern in the President Jack Young's office. Uh, let me see. Uh, well, with the law department, they give the report. Um, so uh, at this time, uh, we also have Larry Green to my right, who is my staff person. Matt Larry Green, Antoine Banks. 
I haven't had my two cups. I haven't had my two cups of coffee yet. We have Antoine Banks to my right. He's the yeah, staff Green, person, Green, and Larry Green up there is the director of councilmatic uh, services. If I forgot anyone, I apologize. Raise your hand if you should be. Also, want to thank uh, Morgan State University, um, Robin Gray from the governmental relations team for uh, being the host. Also, he's here, Ed Hiscock, who uh, represents uh, Morgan State University. I think most of us know Mr. Ed Hiscock. And we will be, if anyone wants to testify, the sign seats are in the upstairs in the, in the front. Um, at this time, we will start with the planning department. You can tell we're not warning people. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, briefly, and the, this brief introduction is a repeat uh, from the previous about what is zoning for uh, new people attending. And of course, it is the rules and regulations placed on land um, as to what and how you can build. Um, and it, the purpose of zoning is for the public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, and zoning goes back to actually the 1920s in Baltimore, but most recent, our most recent code we're working under is 1971. Um, the zoning laws are passed by local government under authority given to us from the state of Maryland. And it is important to recognize that zoning does not, it, it sets the uses, it sets the what can happen there, it does not distinguish between good and bad businesses, um, and it does not determine human behavior. Um, it is basically a set of rules, and the rules are tied, which is the text, and then the maps. And of course, if anybody is interested, we do have all the zoning maps out in the lobby and planning staff to answer any individual questions. Um, as I mentioned, our current code was written in 1971. Um, it was very much more auto-oriented and based on a heavier manufacturing base in Baltimore. Much of that has changed in our city and this new code is intended to help the city move forward with those changes. It was directed from our comprehensive plan, Live, Earn, Play, Learn, and the goals are to support and guide development, investment, protect and enhance neighborhoods, strengthen retail, and promote job growth. Um, these were the principles that we used in drafting the code. And, um, this is the table of contents essentially for the code with the two highlighted um, areas for today's discussion. Um, so essentially titles one through five are the administrative sections. Six is the introduction to how the districts works, basically explain that there's districts and they have corresponding maps. Uh, seven through 12 are the districts. Then we have planned unit development, uh, use standards, and parking signage and that sort of thing. The non-conformities and administrative appeals are at the end. Um, the general organization in the districts, seven through 12, is each one is a district. There are tables that give the use permissions and tables that give what we call the bulk regulations. So that's heights, yards, setbacks, that sort of thing design standards if necessary, and then cross-references to things like parking or signage. This is a typical table that exists throughout the code. It is intended to be um, clearer and easier to read than our current code, which has uses listed in outline format and um, is many pages longer. Essentially, uh, the uses are down the vertical column and the districts across the top. P means permitted and C is a conditional use. If it's blank, it is not permitted or not allowed. Uh, in the far right column on each of the tables is a cross reference if there exists one to Title 14, which would be specific standards for that use. Uh, we have gone through a generic use approach which groups like uses under categories such as retail goods for stores or personal service establishments for your sort of beauty shop, barber shop, that sort of thing. Um, 
uses can be called out separately when they have unique impacts um, and circumstances. And so that is the case. The uses are always listed in alphabetical order. I mentioned the standards. This is an integral part of the uses because this is where it tells you uh, if there are specific site standards for the use or um, any details uh, and um, the standards as well for temporary uses. So chapters, um, oh, and these are the bulk tables. This is for title um, eight. I'm sorry, this is just a sample of the bulk tables here. And this is how they work in terms of the dimensions, uh, lot areas, front yard, backyard, again, in tabular form across the top. OK, so District 7 is our open space and environmental district. This is new to the zoning code. Um, we previously created an open space district, um, but didn't really fully map it under our existing code. This was an important recommendation of our comprehensive plan was to have a coherent zoning around open space and environmental elements. Uh, most of our parks, maybe many folks may not realize that most of our parks today have residential zoning. Um, and that really is not appropriate for their use. So this is a comprehensive open space district. It is limited to active and pac passive recreation and it applies to, it may apply to public or private open space and cemeteries. We have mapped it to all the city parks in the city, the city owned parks, as well as cemeteries. Uh, this district also includes the floodplain overlay zone and the Chesapeake Bay critical area overlay zone. Um, that is a state mandated overlay zone. This is the use table for uh, air open space, the OS zone. And as you can see, it's extremely limited as to what is permitted there. And then a very few number of uh, conditional uses, the C uses. So if it's not on this list, you can't put it in an open space zone, um, either by special exception or not. Um, so again, these are the recreational and open space uses. There are very limited buildings permitted in the open space zone, but um, these would be the requirements if one were to build a building. Um, they may be a parks building or a rec center or that sort of thing. Title VIII is our lower density residential zone, uh, detached and semi-detached districts. Um, it corresponds to our current low dens density districts, uh, but with some additional added districts. Um, and this was through our community process. We were requested to do the lower density districts of our, uh, the two acre and one acre, um, as well as the 9,000 square feet. What this means essentially is the size of lot required to build a house. So um, up until fairly recently, the largest lot size required was the 7,300 square feet R1. About 10 years ago, the city created an R1A and B, but it was only mapped in a limited area. It wasn't done comprehensively. That R1A and B are replaced by the R1C and D under the new code, and then the others are added, the ones noted as new. The density in the R1 through R4 are very close to, if not identical to, the current code. Um, so the characteristics of these districts is um, the, very, the lot size with R1A the largest, R4 is the smallest. Um, we have new regulations on maximum impervious surfaces. Um, this is new to this code and that is for sustainability and environmental reasons to um, limit the ability to just pave an entire uh, lot. So that's in, in percentage portions. We also have a minimum width requirement for housing. And this again came out of uh, community processes that under the current code, the only 
area dimension is the area or the 7,300 square feet. It doesn't say the proportions of that lot. And we've had places, um, primarily actually in, in Northwest Baltimore, where folks have found 7,300 square foot lots that are very, very long and skinny and proposed to build houses on them that are very out of character to the existing houses in the area because they're very narrow, thin houses when the entire neighborhood character is wide porch fronts. So we put in a minimum width requirement based on the character of those areas. So that is new. Um, again, the uses are primarily residential with some limited institutional and open space uses. There are design standards for the detached dwellings, very minimal design standards, and um, multifamily was a lim it was conditional in uh, R2 and R4, and that has been eliminated. Um, and I should note the council members do have amendments from the Planning Commission, but the Planning Commission did recommend that the design standards be pulled out into a separate document, and um, that is in your package of amendments. Um, so again, here's the table equivalent to what we saw for Title VII. This would be the table for Title VIII, permitted, conditional, and um, the various uses listed there. Um, you will note some of the new uses that are new to our code, such as community managed open space and um, urban agriculture. And this is the bulk requirements. Again, the similar format, uh, which has the lot area. This is the min the next line is the minimum lot width that I discussed earlier, um, the heights and uh, lot coverage, that sort of thing, and the maximum impervious which is new. Um, we did not change the building height uh, from the current code. And these are the yard requirements. Okay. And um, that is the presentation on Title 7 and 8. Do you want me to Thank questions? you, we're going to, uh, Councilman Mary Pat Clark has a question. Uh, yes. Oh. You have it. Oh. Um, let me just. I, I have a number of questions, but I, if I get two. Uh, but you just said, and I, I just want to clarify, because it sure is going to save me a lot of grief. You're taking all this idea of design standards out of the zoning code, correct? The recommendation of the Planning Commission. Um, in their amendments was to take the design standards out of the zoning code as code to keep design standards, but to put them in a separate document similar to what we've presented to you as the landscape guidelines, and that they would be referenced and then they could be amended by the Planning Commission. So the code will still have design standards, but not directly in the text. Let, let me just, let me just about that. Um, there's two elements in this zoning code that I don't believe belong there, but if you're going to have them as a code issue, then we need them to be in the code so that we, the council, has the power to enact, amend, etc. One of them is this whole design standards, and the other one is this whole Baltimore City landscape plan. Now, both are wonderful things, and we should all love that. They're not, they're, they complicate the code, but if anyone is going to say they are in, we can't just adopt them by reference. We can't just say, this is part of the code. We haven't seen it. It's in planning. And if you don't do it, you're violating the code. So it's either got to be fish or cut bait in or out. And so I've already, we've already asked for a copy of the Baltimore City Landscape Manual. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to put either of those design standards 
are, or a landscape manual, wonderful as they are, into a zoning code, which people have to refer to as, on a daily basis for use, and it's really, it's really a nuts and bolts document. But if we, if, but we can't adopt them by reference and then hand them over to, uh, you know, not <coughs> wonderful as can be, honestly, hand them over to, you know, generations of staff people, really, in agencies to amend. But, they're but if you violate, you're, you violated the whole okay. code. So I, I think what um, Mr. Chairman um, and Mr. Penny, what I'm saying is we've got to, these have got to be in or out. And if they're out, you give them to the CHAP. CHAP is the agency that people go through a million, they jump through a million hoops to give CHAP the authority right? to tell them about how many cornices or what color their cornices should be and all that kind of stuff. I like some of the standards that I've seen. But I don't think they belong here, or if they do, we have got to take accountability and responsibility for them so that down through the years, people will know who to hold responsible. As the code is drafted, the um, landscape manual is um, the authority to develop the landscape manual is in the code without the actual manual, but it says the criteria and the authority. As City Council Bill 120152 is drafted right now, the design standards are actually integrated in. So actually you sort of have a bifurcated system now, so you can look at both and... You have, you have one more question, yeah, Kathy. Yeah, question. go ahead. You said you would recommend that the design standards out. Let's deal with that. It's the planning what? commission in their vote, the planning commission in their vote and submitted to this body recommended the design standards come out. As we presented it to the planning commission, they still want the design standards. They want them in a separate manual that the planning commission can amend. As long as it is not by reference to code. No, it is tied to reference by code in their recommendation. So we got, all right, so that's, we got to do, so we got to, we got to issue. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Councilman, Councilman Henry and then Councilman Kraft has a follow-up question in regards to uh, Councilman Clark. Sorry. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, can I talk a little bit about uh, density and occupancy? Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the new, in, this, in this new comprehensive rezoning and change of the code, uh, how, how would, how would, how? <laughs> Do that three times. <laughs> How many unrelated people can live in a house? We, we did not change that aspect of the current code, um, and that is in the definition of a family, and we carry that definition over from the current code, which is the, no more than four unrelated persons. Okay, well then, here, I, I've, I've had conversations recently with Baltimore County officials, my district um, abuts, the county, and have we have several we have several neighborhoods where the neighborhood crosses the city county line, so it's the same housing stock on each side of an invisible line. But the way the county approaches occupancy is, if it is more than three unrelated, then it is treated as a different kind of use. And what I wanted to know is, given that for R1 through R4, we're already consciously saying we're trying to reduce and maintain a lower density in those areas. Would there be a difficulty, a structural difficulty with 
reducing the occupancy in those zoning districts. Again, the occupancy is tied to the definition of family, and family is used so we would, in those we would, differences but we would, as well as the other districts. So we would just have a different definition for R1 through R4. Um, we have to confer a law on that one. I'm not sure okay. how technically you would do that because it's one word and one definition that's used in multiple places. Um, so let's break it up and use a different set of words in different places. Have one hear, word hear that we bro. use for R1 for R4 yeah. and then another word that we use yeah, for R5 for right. right. We could take a look at I, I believe the county it would, it, the way they approach it is if you have more than, if you have three or more unrelated people, then it's considered a boarding house as a use, regardless of, there's not a discussion about defining it as a family, it's defined the other way around. If the people aren't related, then it's a boarding house. So. Okay. 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 Uh, Councilman, Council, yeah, Councilman Kraft, uh, Councilman Kraft, Following up and then, uh, uh, here. Here you go. Okay. I'd like to follow up on uh, Councilwoman Clark's um, line of questioning um, <clears throat> with regard to the design standards and the landscape manuals and um, the Planning Commission recommending that this. Uh, did I hear you right when you said that the Planning Commission recommended that the design standards come out so and if they needed to amend them, they would amend them? The design standards as written in the bill in front of you are integrated into the text of the code. I understand And that. if they were to be amended, it would need to be by the council. The landscape manual as it's written is not done that way. It's done under the authority to create it by the Planning Commission, and um, they want the design, they recommend the design standards to be done in that same manner. So that they could amend it also, right? Right. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I tend to agree with Councilman Clark with regard to this. I mean, if it's going to be, it either needs to be in or be out, um, and I tend to want it to be in at this point okay. um, and and this is the reason why um, in the master plan we have adopted by reference the sustainability plan mm -hmm. and yet if you look at the sustainability plan and the master plan in many ways they are in conflict with one another um, and because they're adopted by reference, the sustainability plan many times is ignored, um, and we move forward with the master plan, giving that, I think, de facto preference over it because the sustainability plan is adopted by reference, it's not there, and it is, in fact, in conflict in many instances. If it's not, in conflict by word, it's in conflict by implementation. Um, <clears throat> I think that if we keep the landscape manual and the design standards in the code, then it's much less likely that there would be any conflict um, and that there would be, um, they would ri be written for lack of a better word, more harmoniously so that everything flowed together and that if someone were to look at it, whether they be a citizen or a developer or anyone else, that they could look at it all in one place, all at one time, and see yeah. how it all comes together okay. rather than have to go fishing for it. <laughs> okay. Councilwoman uh, Spector? Yes, uh, when we talked about family being there to destroy the uh, law firm has to deal with that. Uh, I've had situations where I think it's for no more than four unrelated persons in terms of density. 
We're going to have to work with the law department on the family issue because I think that goes to broader questions. But by the zoning one before or more, there is a maximum amount of people that can occupy that house, whether so the family or not, before we can permit it to be the density to really be a value, controlling the density of that property. I understand. I don't know of any jurisdiction that, that actually controls the number of bodies r related in a house. Other than there are housing codes, you know, in terms of space and windows, um, but we can take a look at that. being in the code because then it's a zoning enforcement if something is not maintained right. or, or we can't lose that leverage. Yeah. Well. Right. Cap Councilwoman Clark and then Councilman Henry. Uh, please yeah. reflect the Councilman Clark with the green Councilman Clark. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. okay. within 
the dwelling unit. As long as they share a common entrance and cooking and bathroom facilities. I take that out. Um, in my in my um, amendment. Look, I raised four kids, well, my husband and I. And your mother did. And my mother was across the street. Yes. We love the members of the family. Um, we raised four kids. You know, anyway, it doesn't matter. We, we certainly, if we had had two rumors to jump with those four kids in a, pretty, in a three story house, First of all, there wouldn't be any parking spaces on Clover Hill Road for anybody else in the neighborhood. And second of all, my neighbors would run crazy because of the extra people. I don't know where this came from, and I don't see how the law department has any role in it. That should go. And then the other one is, I changed in my amendment because of our city, county, remember with all the stormwater, we were all, we, we're always looking across the boundary lines of Baltimore County to see what they were doing. Not that they were a model, but they're next door neighbors. And next door, um, I believe, when they say how many unrelated people can live in a dwelling unit, I believe they say no more than two unrelated. So I amended us to keep up with my proposed amendment to keep up with that. I mean, we have got uh, these definitions require a lot, a lot, a lot of study and work with planning and work with us um, because that it all comes back to them, and in many cases, because so many people have a hand and they're all talented in writing this. The definition in the front doesn't match the description of the same thing that under uses. So we have a conflict built in to what things mean in some cases, because I think different people wrote the same, you know, the definitions. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Councilwoman, this is this is gonna be a long journey and we're gonna do it right. So yes. anyway. Uh, Councilman Kraft. If I can just ask you, Laurie, and, and use mm -hmm. three specific examples to follow up on this, and because um, the, all three of these happen in my district on a, on a regular basis. One is the traditional large Catholic families where we have the little townhouses and we have mom and dad and six or seven kids in a three bedroom house. Mm -hmm. Um, or like my own family, my father's family that had 13 kids, you know, in, um, in a, you know, a three bedroom house. Um, the, um, the second thing is the multi-generational family where you have mom and dad and a kid and grandpa and grandpa and an aunt and uncle and they're all related, they're all multi-generational, they're, they're living in the house. And then third is where you have the day laborers and the day laborers are being crammed into a house and they're paying $200 a week cash and you have 15 or 20 of them where they're just throwing mattresses across the floor. Um, and you know, on every level with one bathroom or two bathrooms. Uh, and they're getting somehow by on that under, in some cases, boarding houses, in some cases just illegal usage, but whatever. Um, so if we could take those sort of three examples and see the, how we... The first two fall under the definition of a family as written. And again, we did not change the definition of a family from the current code. All of that about rumors, all of that is in the current code. We didn't really open any of that up. Um, your third category, uh, it would depend on the zoning district. In our very highest districts, you can do rooming and boarding houses. Um, I believe it's generally a conditional use, though I'd have to double check. 
And, um, but my guess is in most of those cases, it's not legally there. And they would be subject to the four persons. Um, I know another situation that's probably more prevalent in Councilwoman Clark's district is the college students doing a similar thing. And they are subject to the four persons in a dwelling unit. It is very difficult to enforce because somebody has to physically go and witness that there's more than four people actually living there. there it has been done, but it's difficult. Well, well, somebody just needs to go in during the daytime and count the mattresses laying mm -hmm. on the floor. Mm -hmm. That would be zoning enforcement. Thank you. Yeah. Councilman uh, Bill Henry, then uh, Councilwoman Spector. Yes. And just to describe the situation, one of the reasons why I raised the issue in the R1 star fours is because uh, I'm dealing with a situation where students at Towson University are surrounded by Baltimore County neighborhoods where they cannot legally live three or more in a dwelling unit. The next closest place geographically to Towson, to Towson campus, are the neighborhoods on the northern edge of Baltimore City where there are the same houses as up in the county, but now they can legally have four in a house. And as you point out, given the difficulties of enforcement and the strain that our, uh, our bureaucracies are often under, I've got notable, you know, numerous anecdotal instances of five and six and more students living in these good-sized houses um, where I, I think we need to be addressing this. If, we're, if, if we've got the code open in front of us, this is the time to address it. And I'll start with the fact that why would we want to continue to perpetuate the concept that a family equals a certain number of unrelated people. Like, why wouldn't we take this opportunity now when we're dealing with Fix it. looking at the code That's to say a family equals people who are related by blood or marriage, and then come up with some other term for a group of X number of people who live together who aren't related. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Spector. Yeah, I just wanted to add that when we deal with what we passed as law and in the enforcement, especially with the density, uh, so many times when we are complaint generated and they go out to that residence, uh, they, they measure it by mailboxes or maybe how many people. That's not a good measure because a lot of these students, you know, people, they don't use it as a mailing address. So it's very hard on the ground to count how many uh, have, have, are actually overpopulating that house. And worse than that, in my case, yeah, sometimes those extra people are dormitory, like living in the basements. The guy who lived in the tragedy of fire or something like that, it was really, really scary. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Councilwoman Clark. Yes, I, I'd like to go back and talk about open space. Okay. Um, that is a that is a um, a zoning category um, that is designed to protect, preserve, <coughs> etc., public and private open space. Um, so. What I wanted to see, I had a number of questions about that, but one of the things that I wanted to do was to amend um, the, the, the eligible permitted uses so that it says community managed open space, including greenhouses and community gardens. In other words, um, I have a lot of areas in my district 
that our community gardens or community managed open space? I think it, oh, it's covered in the definition of the community managed open space, so that definition is broader, so the line on the table is shorter, and then the definition includes those well, elements. There aren't, I don't see any community gardens on the map, on the map of a, that, uh, in my district. I, I, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm using a 14th <coughs> district map. So, although you, it may be in the definition section, um, it doesn't say so. I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't see anything like that on the map. So. If the individual properties would then need to get the OS, OS zone if you wanted that restriction. Well, wouldn't we be, isn't this the time when we grant it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, that's, yeah, I, I thought you were changing the use, but you're, you're suggesting a map change, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was a use change. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. If opens, I mean, there's not a lot of protection we need to protect through the Oak Park. I mean, there's a lot of work we need to do with the reservoir and find the ferret and all those things. But there's not a lot we need to do besides the fact it's public land. We own it. Oh, but okay. But okay, it's designated on the map as open space. So now in my district, I've got homestead harvest. It's um, actually, I've got, I'm going to put an amendment in to put it on the map. It's 621 Homestead Street over by the um, Case Harbor. Uh, okay. We've got, um, we've got a here, community right. garden it's on uh, Fox Street in Remington in my district. Now, I mean, in all these cases, I've got to say to the community, it, I mean, do you want to preserve this as open space or not? Correct. Right. So, but if they do, and there's a history of, and there is in both cases, of coordinated management by the community of the state, I want to preserve. And then it goes to the next step, too. I've got, um, and, and I'll just lay this on the table so we can work it out. In the current zoning code, there's something called P. It is it is for park. Right? It's public. Park, right? For um, public. Public, public, public. I know that. I did it. Now, not many people use this part of the code, but it's very, it is a protection. So in, in my district, for example, we now have a, oh, it's a building leased by the city, not owned by the city. So it's not public. That's a great big building at 29th and uh, Remington, and um, the, the person in, that helped with this, or initiated this legislation is here today. But what happened was we, it's like an overlay. So you can put a public overlay over underlying, under, underlying zoning. And what it means is that if anyone starts to sell that property, it has to be reviewed for public use first because they want a school day. So that disappeared in this, but I'd like to find a way to let open space here have a little P section as protecting things against future development that haven't popped yet, but that but the community has in mind for future development for the use of the public in some way. So we can't do this here, but I just laid that on okay. the table, Mr. Chairman, okay. um, so that we can- We'd be glad to work with you on that. Yeah, thank you. Laurie, um, piggybacking on Councilwoman Clark, um, I have some community gardens in my district, like Fisher's Cove and Cherry Hill. Mm -hmm. So they, all those community gardens will be grandfathered in, or do they have to the community gardens are a permitted use in both the open space zone and the residential zones, so that shouldn't be a problem. If they are seen as permanent open space by the community, the council person, etc., then they should be considered for OS zoning. But 
the, if it's a community garden that's maybe a transition, some community gardens are seen as a transition right. to another type of use, then we wouldn't recommend the OS zoning for that type of property. It would be a decision based on the individual circumstances. Okay, Councilman Kraft and Councilwoman Clark. Yeah, I want to talk about um, code enforcement for a second um, with the zoning administrator just because um, sort of tagging on this, you know, family versus multi-family. We have a great difficulty with code enforcement. I think, one, there's not enough people in the office, and two, we have this problem with, um, with being able to, quote, unquote, catch people. Um, and get in their houses. And I don't know whether we can write this into the code or something and, you know, but th this is a situation that, that we've had recently and I'm, whether this is your thoughts or we just put on there or what your thoughts are, but we have folks that are advertising. I mean, they're saying, you know, one, two, three, South Linwood Avenue, three apartments. $1,500 a month per apartment, right? It's an R8, it can't be apartments. Right, not right? legally established. Not legally apartment. established. We call, complain, they say, we can't get in to see it. We say, all you have to do is go online, you can look at all three apartments. They said, well, we can't get in to see it. We said, but you know, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to see that they're advertising three apartments, here they are, look online, but we've got to get in to see it. Or you go up to the hospital at Bayview and you know they've got rent an apartment, pull this number off, and they've got the address for a place that's got five apartments for rent, and it's at 2600 East Baltimore Street, which is a single family house, and they're renting five apartments. And again, they say they can't get in, but we can go show you where they're renting the apartments off. You know, clearly, how do we do this? How I do think we? We have to work with um, the housing department, which oversees the code enforcement and the law department, to see what would be maybe more modern techniques. I if mean, there are any. I mean, clearly, you know, the people are flaunting the law right in our face. They're saying it, and we're saying because we can't get in the house, we can't tell them to violate the law when they're saying, when they're out there telling us, hey, we're violating the law, you know, we, we got to find a way to do this, okay, somehow. Okay. Any, any other, no. uh, any other questions, Councilwoman Clark? I just want to um, follow up. Let me clarify that, I think. First of all, community managed gardens are permitted in both residential zones and in OS, so they could be in either category. And in our mapping that we prepared, our planners did their best in working with the communities to, you know, and looking at the ownership and whether it's considered a temporary or more permanent um, to map the community gardens appropriately. If we missed something, or if you are disagreeing with our, you know, attempts or, or things like that, then that would obviously be a map change. But it, it's not that we didn't map any community gardens open space. Some are, but we may not be aware of all the details. Okay, so basically you do have some in some districts that you map. Yes. Okay, good. So we just bring you in, well, we bring it now to us. Right. We bring in and we zone. To, and see, that's here's what protection that affords. 
It would need an ordinance to change it to build anything, is what it would. Yeah, and it would, it would have to go through the city council. It ain't going to happen. So that basically, every place can plant a tulip and call it a community garden. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what the community's talking about. But there are long term things that somebody can show up that just got back from Florida after being there for 25 years and wants to build a high rise on the tulip patch, okay? Happens. So if it's an important enough element in a community, we already know it enhances the value of the community, there's research for that, then let's keep it and not have it always be threatened and that's a protection that the that, uh, permitted use or whatever doesn't allow. It says, you can't come take this back after 25 years. And you know that if, if people are doing a community garden, they've already been forced to try to scout out the owner before they ever get that use approved. So, Correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Any other questions for planning? Thank you, Laurie. Uh, Law Department, um, can, you, can you address Councilman Kraft's question? He's not here right now. Step down for a moment. In regards to code enforcement, you understand this question, right? Good morning, Elena DePeter from the Baltimore City Law Department. Um, as I understand Councilman Kraft's question, he was concerned about enforcement of illegal apartments in residential districts. I, I mean, I don't think there's necessarily one easy answer to this. I think it's something we should get together with the zoning administrator and the law department and determine what they can, how they can legally enter those types of um, dwellings and you know assess whether or not there's um, separate living units and, and that sort of thing in, in particular unit. Yeah, he, he he stepped out for a moment, but I think that I mean I have the I have the uh, I have the same um, issue in my district, and I think Councilman Cole does too with these universities that um, like over in Barry Circle, it's like two you know it's a single family dwelling. And they have like nine students coming in, living there. And of course, when zoning enforcement knocks on the door, they can't get in. But you can. I mean, it's in it's in any type of media, you know, uh, the universities, newspaper, whatever, that says it's for rent. So, you know, that has to be worked out. I mean, if there's proof that they're renting it then it really should be a no-brainer that something should be done without having well, I think an answer. You have to look, I think there's two separate issues. The one issue is the density within a single unit. Like, are there, are there more people living there than the zoning code allows in a single unit? And then there's the question of whether there's multiple units in an area that's zoned residential and, and not zoned for multiple units. So I think we need to look at both scenarios and determine what are the appropriate ways to prove that those illegal uses are taking place um, and you know documenting it and providing that uh, information to the zoning administrator okay any any of my colleagues on the committee have a question yeah, i think that it's a matter of, i'd like to just come in and say that we know from years and years of experience that there are almost no zoning inspectors and that they work nine to five and that they don't, they're just not. Housing mean, inspectors may be the summer they work at this point. But what, what my colleagues have said is true. So I think what we're looking for, since we're rewriting a code, what we're looking for is some kind of documentation based uh, termination of a use and occupancy permit or something of that kind. So what, I'll give that, sure thing. Just, you want to follow through with it? It's what, in other words, what can we do? We can't make, we can't make zoning inspectors work after 4.30 at night when well, maybe we could. Uh, so maybe they could get in there and maybe that's the answer. But when they find out something in violation, what do they do? Well, even if they see it, what do they do? Kick their ass out. Well, but 
All that what they need to do is do that legally, and also the, our law needs to provide for what my colleague said, the chairman, documentation. You see their rent and rooms in a single family house. We can demonstrate that in in a newspaper ad, we can call up and they show us a room. That's illegal. Full their use and occupancy permit for the entire place, so nobody can live there until they get that cleaned up. We could do that without zone, without. That's a practical way to do it. There's no reason not to do it and write it into the code. If, if I could tag on, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah, um, in ter Elena, in terms of this, there has to be a method of enforcement that is used because the current methods of enforcement, it's like stop work orders. I mean, we'll give a stop work order when we really should make somebody stop working or they've already done the whole job and we should make them tear it down because they did it without permits, they did it illegally, but we don't because they say it's economic hardship or whatever. So they just know that they can do it all, they'll pay a $500 fine or they'll do a, pay a $1,000 fine and it's the cost of doing business. It's the same thing in these instances. You know, they'll come in and they'll go through this process and then they try to find a way to make it legal or they say, well, we already have these apartments, these people are here, blah, 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 blah. We need to have a tool that works and we need to make it mandatory. I mean, it's got to be something that I mean, unfortunately, we have to take the discretion away from whoever it is, whether it's the zoning administrator or wh whomever it is, whoever it is, the discretion has to be taken away so that if the person is renting multiple units and they're not allowed to make them, then they got to put the people out and they got to put it back the way it's supposed to be. Well, I think the answer now that you know we are working on the zone code is to provide for our different um, penalty provisions in those instances. Um, and we'd love for and be happy to work with um, planning to to develop a stricter penalties that would make it you know not profitable to try to circumvent the law. Okay. Uh, certainly, I'll work with a, a task force of concluding council members. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. for make it happen. We're sitting around for the next year reviewing a zoning code, and at the end of the day, half of it doesn't mean very much if we can't enforce it. And money raising fines does not do it. We've got to make we got to make it stop. And we've got to use evidence that is, a, is accessible to the general public to do it. This, Here you. Yeah, th oh. this, is our, this is the opportunity to do that. So, Council, Councilwoman uh, Sharon Green Milton. Um, just, just to add, just to add to the.
renters. Um, I have an area in, in our pipes that has a very high number of renters. We need to pay attention and, and look at the, the rules for landlords because they pay, play a role in this as well. Um, and again, it piggybacks on, again, we're going back to revitalization and, and the open space and our, and our community gardens. We, we all have community gardens in our district. These are all new type things. And again, they all correlate and work together. So um, it's important that code enforcement play, plays a big role in this. And we, uh, the city needs to look at hiring the, the need that that agency is requesting. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, thank you very much, Laurie. Um, next report, DPW. Do you have any a report, anything to add to this? Good morning. Good morning, Marcia Collins, representing the Department of Public Works and the Department of General Services today. Um, I don't have any uh, specific things to add to our report. I have been listening to the discussions. I would just say that for the um, open space environmental districts, uh, this does provide us the opportunities uh, where we have government facilities that are also providing amenities to the community to continue. We appreciate that fact. Um, we appreciate the fact that our facilities would be permitted uses in these cases. Um, in regards, this is totally outside of my agency purview, but in the discussions about density and, and how you would tackle these issues, I think part of, the, part of the issue is that it's not any one thing. I think we, we're looking at the zoning code today, but usually when we try to tackle a problem, we uh, try to do some proactive issues up front and if the issues are with for example student housing um, if we just look at it from an enforcement perspective what will happen is that uh, you have a student coming to Baltimore they're attending school they found a cheaper alternative other than campus housing they come in and their family moves them in and the family waves goodbye and then two days later they're put out on the street. So I, I think that part of the issue about enforcement is also the proactive approach where, you know, could we look at a program where you actually go out and you talk to all of the college uh, housing um, facilities. They all post these types of things on their bulletin boards and I would seem to me that um, they don't want their students put out on the street because they inadvertently chose to live in a place that they didn't realize wasn't appropriately zoned. So I think some of it has to do with not just enforcement, but in talking to um, the colleges, for example, if it's a, a student issue, and working with their housing people to make sure that what is being posted is appropriate. Because you don't want, you know, these students just all of a sudden, their couch and their, <laughs> everything's out in the street and they're supposed to be going to, school and um, they have no place to live because they've already filled all the dorms. So I, I just offer that out. Sometimes when we're dealing with a new program, we try to do some proactive educational stuff in advance to try and minimize the distress that occurs in these kinds of issues. Um, but I have found the conversation to be very interesting. Um, other than that, I would be happy to answer any I questions specific yeah. to um, our departments. Marsha, well, I just think that was the emotional response from Councilman Kraft because we're dealing with that situation so much. So, you know, uh, it's a good point. Yeah. Anyone else for? Okay. Um, I just you. want to recognize that we do have, um, they don't have a report. BDC is uh, represented here today. Uh, we are now going to go into. Uh, the audience testimony. Uh, we only have two people that signed up. So what I'm saying, if anyone else wishes to testify, instead of walking up the steps and go outside, you can come in, just come down here and, and sign up if you wish. Uh, at this time, we have Joan Floyd. Is 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Joan Floyd, um, President of the Remington Neighborhood Alliance. Uh, regarding open space, yes, it's very important to permanently preserve open space. Years ago, we did begin to seek that protection for all of our parks in Remington. Unfortunately, two small parks in our neighborhood were left off the proposed map of protected open space areas. These are our recently renovated plaza at 28th and Fox Streets and our recently uh, reworked play lot at Miles and 27th Streets. Uh, so I am asking for the map to be amended to zone both of these parks as open space. Um, at the last here, uh, on another issue, at the last hearing I spoke about residential density in commercial districts. Today I'm going to speak about commercial density in residential districts. Uh, the new R4 district provides an example of an issue that we see in the new R5 and up. What we see is a very different treatment of minimum lot area for non-residential uses. In the new R4 district, non-residential uses may be established on lots of only 3,000 square feet. The same number is used in the new row house districts. In our current R4 and row house districts, the minimum, minimum lot area for non-residential uses is 5,000 to 15,000 square feet with a maximum lot area variance of 25%. This strictly limits the zoning board's authority to reduce minimum lot area to an absolute floor amount. This scheme effectively prevents houses from being converted to non-residential use because the absolute floor amount cannot be satisfied by an average residence. In the proposed new code, in addition to a much lower minimum lot area for non-residential uses, there is no maximum variance, and thus no floor amount and no limit on the zoning board's authority. And beginning in the R5 district, there is a long list of additional non-residential uses under the neighborhood commercial banner, such as offices, restaurants, and almost every kind of retail, all with a low minimum lot area and no limit on the zoning board's authority to reduce it. All of this has the effect of transforming residential districts into mixed-use districts. This is something that we had not talked about and did not expect. We ask you to hold a separate hearing on the changes in minimum lot area for non-residential uses. Those who live in these proposed districts that are affected are unaware of this major change and its consequences. We need public awareness of this issue, and this body needs genuine feedback. Thank you. Um, can you, as I always say, can you, okay, all right. And, and, and you know to forward your amendments to uh, Antoine or? Um, yeah. Well, can we, you can have we do that? Um, I, I think that we should have that. Well, in regards to her request, a separate hearing, the, the committee will meet and we'll reconsider that. We do have a, we do have a Use the microphone, Councilwoman. We do have a hearing scheduled on these. Um, uh, we get to multifamily on October 22nd. Now that's our, our city council hearing on that was at 6 30. Where is it? Oh, Mr. Ray. So perhaps we, we could focus on we, that issue at yeah. that hearing. As Councilman, as Councilman Kraft says, we have, we have time. We're not rushing anything through. So to you get your know, testimony, that's going to be considered, you know. Uh, option, we'll discuss that. Yeah, we, we have time for that. And if I could just make a quick observation. Go ahead. Today, you and I'm glad to hear that you all were really discussing the issue of residential density, but nobody nobody was talking about commercial density until I came up. So I think that issue doesn't necessarily rise to the top That's, when you think about talking about is, houses. Yeah. Joan, that is why we're having hearings and, and testimony because Casper Craft. Yeah, um, just to, to tag on to what the chairman said, you know, this is only the third hearing. We had one in April here. We're going to be working on this bill for the better part of a year. I mean, we're just beginning. So just because we didn't talk about something the other yesterday, and that doesn't mean we're not thinking about it. I mean, we're going to be going through this first series of presentations and then we're going to be going through this bill, and many of us feel like we're going to be going through it page by page, looking at it to make sure that every single thing is considered. So 
Um, there's, this is not something that, you know, we're looking and saying, oh my God, we gotta pass this by Christmas, you know? Maybe we'll pass it by next Christmas. Right, and, and, and that's, you know, why I made the request I made, because the idea was not to send me here today to just to carp about something, but to ask, let's have, let, let's have a hearing on this issue. Yeah. Joan, just, just put it on the table. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Howard. Uh, Aylesworth. Aylesot. Aylesworth. Aylesworth. Okay. You'll get it. I apologize. That's okay. They do the same with vice singers. So. There, <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm here in two capacities. The first as a, as a citizen, and I want to say that I've been involved in Title uh, in the development of uh, Title Seven, and wanted to thank Lori especially yeah, can for. Can you pick up? Your, yeah. yeah. Pick up. This is. Am I doing this? Yeah. Okay. Larry, can you adjust that for him? So. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. Okay. So, as a citizen, I've been working on developing Title VII for a long period of time. I've worked with Lori uh, about on this and wanted to thank her for um, really constructive um, help and resolutions of some of the issues. I'm also here as the president of the Department of Rec and Parks Advisory Board to say that we are going to be reviewing this and we'll um, want to work uh, with the city council in perfecting the, if, the, if perfection needs to be um, done. And that we are also going to incorporate this in part of a uh, development of a master plan, a, a open space uh, master plan and a rec and park master plan um, and so we will be working with you on that also. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Any, any questions from Councilman, Councilwoman Inspector? I just, um, who else are you uh, vetting these issues with that are interested in all these parks? You want to talk? I was thinking of parks and people. Yes, yes. I just wanted us to get the benefit of their resources. Yes, the advisory board actually um, has as one of its goals to work with all the friends groups, all the groups such as Parks and People and so forth. And right now, we are in fact um, in discussions with the U.S. Department of Interior upon developing an, uh, an urban wilderness and uh, Parks and People is part of that. So Jackie and myself. Um, are working with them and um, to get funding for that. So that, that's what, that's what I was going to go because I know there's a lot of resources that include those people that are involved. Oh, and yeah. in the future, but I don't think there's a lot of resources that are involved. Right, and that's, uh, and that's a second Right, and as a secondary issue, we have also uh, worked with uh, Ernest Burkeen, who's the director of Brecken Parks. Um, and we are going to be uh, doing a national certified um, audit and accreditation of the of the department to the federal standards. Yes. Federal. This is not U.S. federal. It's the it's the um, National Recreation and Park Association um, accreditation. Well, and City does have some federal open space, so that we okay. can put the federal. Those areas have great advocates. Yes. Have them in the debate situation. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, we I have think our that's a good suggestion. Councilman Kraft, and Councilwoman Middleton, and Councilwoman Clark. Okay. Um, Howard, did I hear you say that there is a Department of Recreation and Parks master plan being developed right now? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Um, we have to get to get funding, though. <laughs> okay. Councilman Cole is the chairman of the council's committee, uh, on, subcommittee on um, recreation and parks. Has has that committee been involved in this at all, or have they been briefed on this at all? No, not not yet. 
Okay, yeah. can, you count, can you follow up with the councilman yes. and make sure that there is a committee briefing on this? Yes. Okay, thank you. I mean, we're, we're, it's just, I mean, we're just starting as a, as a, as a you know, board, so it's going to take a while, but I think that going in and making him aware of this is important, so we yeah. will do that. Okay, great, thank you. Caps. Castwoman uh, Middleton. Council members, just wanted to let you know, even though this gentleman is not um, representing the sustainability commission this evening, the commission is also, and we have conversations, and I'm sure we're going to be discussing this as well. Yes, yes, definitely. Councilwoman Clark. Uh, Howard, I, I'll ask you a question because you've been, you just indicated negotiations and working hard and all that kind of stuff. And I'm, I mean, basically, I, I'm new to it. And so I'm trying to understand parts of what this open space does. And here's a question for you, because it must have come up in your negotiations. Why is a parking lot take Clifton Park or if you were to take Druid Hill Park, right, you, you would see a lot of parking space and a lot of paved space. If you go to a park like Herring Run Park, there's no through traffic allowed on it. We do have um, greenway trails that essentially are one lane roads, but those are established because the Department of Public Works has a number of sewage and freshwater um, or stormwater, um, you know, pipes that are running through it. It's where the uh, pipe that connects us to um, get our emergency water if we need to, that it comes through there. So we need those existing structures in case there's any kind of a, of a problem with it that, that, that well, DPW can do that. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering, and maybe it's, it's, I'm getting the impression that you have this parking lot and there's this The fact that it's conditional means that it isn't automatic. Well, right? I know it's that, not but permitted. right now the city council yeah. is not in the code with conditional uses. I'm sure that we will be, but right now conditional is in flux. And mm -hmm. we, so you basically, you, you really weren't involved in this. Um, I changed some of these, which were there were a lot of them that were once permitted that are now conditional. So they haven't been taken off. But the point is, is that permitted, for example, if you were to go down to wireless tele telecommunications antenna, right? That means that 
it doesn't mean that they can just automatically go in there without talking to us, but it means that they have the right of way to do that, whereas if you have conditional under utilities, such as uh, the present um, uh, effort by BG&E to um, take part of Leaping Park and turn it into a meadowland so that they can put a pipe through there, that's conditional. So it has, it's not just automatic. And the stealth things are permitted, right? Stealth uh, communication and tenants, I mean, they're not in amendments I'm recommending. They're all conditional. Right. Right. But there's something called the scout. Right. And what's that? Well, there's one that's like a very, very tall pretend tree that sticks out like a sore thumb. Well, so, what's stealthy about it? Like, does it hide behind the leaves? I think that, leaves? yeah, right, exactly. That's what I think that it means. And you said that's okay, but you and the It's not okay, thing. but at some point you can't just, I mean, they're not going to do exactly what I want them to do. Well, I mean, you have to discuss, sure. discuss, discuss with that. With us now, yeah. we want us to do we might not do it, but what is it? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so Catherine, said, yeah. Ask and you shall receive. Right. Yeah. Catch, catch, so, Howard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and Howard and Catherine Clark, you're doing, you have a task force set up, you're working on this. Yeah. So what we need, and, yeah. what we need from you is whatever amendments you have is to send those amendments to Antoine Banks and the council has their amendments and we're going to look over those amendments in regards to our work sessions right. when, it, when it comes up. Um, any, any questions or concerns or issues that Councilwoman Clark or any of my colleagues have, we can co yeah. correspond with yeah. you to try to work with your task force. Even though yeah. I agree with Councilman uh, Kraft that you need to communicate with Mr. Councilman Cole, who's the subcommittee yeah. chair of that. So, yeah. okay. I think yeah, you're okay. Um, any other questions? Thanks, Howard. Yeah. Um, um, no, I don't have another question, Mr. Use the microphone, please. I mean, you have a I'm comment? Sorry, yeah. um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, apparently it's not necessary for us to discuss every amendment specifically that we are proposing or thinking of proposing, but since I thought we were supposed to, I'm not going, I would like to, as part of the record of this meeting, I have my proposed amendments for all the titles that we've gone up till today, right. today, and I have not discussed them all, but I'm understanding from the law department that the fact that they're being submitted in writing to the committee is they then yeah. they they have invented is that correct? Yeah, Judith. Before I call, can you respond? What, what the we know what the the, the uh, law is says that if we like we're having a hearing right now. So if we want to change an amendment, we didn't discuss it at this hearing. We'd have to have a separate hearing for any amendment we don't we don't discuss. Can you clarify that? She, she's the one that should clarify because I'm hearing different rumors. Yeah, sure. Hearing. Um, because this is a comprehensive rezoning, there's no issues with respect to rehearings on amendments um, that are introduced at a later time. There, the confusion is with this is with the voting session and whether you can uh, introduce an amendment at the voting session without having discussed it at a prior hearing okay. or a prior work session. I think as long as it was, you know, mentioned at a hearing or work session, then you're fine. The question, it, it becomes an open meetings question, I think, when you bring up something completely new at a voting session that nobody has heard about in any of the prior hearings or, or work sessions. So just to, um, to clarify, if I may, just to clarify, if I may, so any time up to the day of the vote, the, the, any work session, any, any work session, any hearing, whatever, um, 
because this is comprehensive rezoning and the entire law is before us and the entire law is open for discussion, we can amend it at any time up until that day. Right, but, the, the, the code but, says that if it's a, something that's brought up outside the scope of the committee process, then you have to give two weeks notice, provide the amendment to legislative reference and planning to be posted on planning's website. I'm, I'm sorry, you just... Then the rehearing requirement is, is, is kicked out. I, you lost me. The two, the two week thing just threw me. What does the two week thing mean? For a if, if comprehensive rezoning. All if, the amendments have to be published two weeks before the voting session, is that what you're saying? An amendment that occurs outside of the committee process can be introduced at any time, um, but in order to vote on it, there has to be two weeks notice um, to, and the copy of the amendments has to be given to uh, legislative reference and planning to okay. be posted on planning's website. Okay, so... Two weeks prior right. to the vote. Okay, so let me restate this so that I... because I think that I had it right a minute ago before you said the two-week thing. So, as long as we are having hearings or we are having announced work sessions, if it's ten months from now, and it is a work session that's an announced work session and we're looking at a bill and somebody looks at that and says, oh my God, I want to do an amendment there. And they say, okay, I introduce an amendment to such and such. That amendment is still in play because it's still part of the comprehensive rezoning and a continuing set of hearings and or work right. sessions. And it's part, you're still in the committee process. The committee has not voted the bill out. Right, okay. That's right. That's what I wanted to make sure. So as long as we're in that process, we can amend it any time. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councilman Henry? I have a clarification from that question. So anything we talked about here today, if the very, very last day of the committee's work deliberations on this, we could, it, I, I could, I could walk in with, a, with an amendment that says, we're changing the definition of family to read X on the on the very last voting, session, voting session because we talked about it at some point during the committee, the open hearing process, and as you as you done, you could do something if it never been talked about until that minute of that day on the work session because the the process is still open until the committee stops working. So if that morning say it was the last work session that day, it was the very last work session, something came up and you said, oh, we haven't dealt with this yet, or I never thought of this before. You could make that amendment that day because it was part of the overall process. Excuse me? Well, but you could. Okay, all right. Councilwoman Ricky Spector. Yes, point of information, because it was put on the table, Definition can family. you do a floor The amendment has a two weeks notice posted on the website. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Councilwoman, well, we have one more person that wants to speak, then we'll go to the council. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Judith? Judith Kunch? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. You have 15 minutes left of morning. My name is Judith Kunst. I'm the president of the Greater Remington Improvement Association. I'm going to speak to you just about your session today. All of our comments will be sent in by our land use committee, and we've been working on our comments for about four years. So you'll be happy to see them after all that. The open space. Mary Pat, thank you very much. Fox Street Garden is thriving, and we're in our fifth year. Please put it on the map. That's a fact, a request. I can put it in writing as well. Yeah, I already agreed to that. Thank you very much. The density and housing that you discussed today is very near and dear to my heart because I'm in a community right now that's going through, I guess, a renaissance, for lack of a better word, 
we have the 25th Street Station development coming, and we have three blocks on Remington Avenue that are going to be renovated, and I have great hopes for them. I have a question from Marshall From where I'm standing to where Councilman Henry is sitting, there's going to be a 130-unit apartment building. We are going to work very, very closely with the developers on this. My biggest nightmare is that they go out of business. We had this discussion, and a 130-unit complex each has four or five college students in there, all 18 and 19. Can you imagine on a little two-lane street on West 27th Street if that would happen? So please define this, put your numbers down, and keep working. It's deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we don't have to imagine if we get Crestmont. <laughs> Mary Pat, Crestmont Lofts plus Crestmont Street just had nine babies. So they're booming no matter how you look at it. <laughs> OK. okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, since there's no more uh, testimony from the audience, we're going to go into the council uh, for any questions or comments. Councilwoman Clark and then Councilman Kraft. Um, and so we have written, uh, I really appreciate all the, the um, good people who advised about this morning. We need something writing so that we have the issue. Yeah, we've got to have that as soon as possible. Um, in the meantime, I'm submitting today um, for the record of this, and I will just call out what they are so it is in the oral record of this hearing. Just the title, right? Yes, okay. I'm not going to argue for them. Okay, all right. Okay, under, <laughs> okay. Under generic use of describe, I'm, um, I'm suggesting that we not rely on generic use definitions since it is not specific or focused enough. Uh, now, in definitions, need an amendment to thank the whole definition better be stretched. Need um, to delete the definition of bed and breakfast, if possible, from this world. Um, or something in between, um, I'm sure my colleagues. Uh, commercial vehicle, I would like to delete the requirement that there's advertising as a condition of being defined as that. Um, to a uh, definition of comprehensive rezoning, I'd like to add that uh, it must be enacted by the mayor and city council. That uh, I would uh, recommend deleting the definition of cultural facility is overly broad and too vague to be useful. Um, I've already, we've already talked about the family. In the definition of financial institution, I would delete the inclusion of standalone automatic tower machines. Um, I, I, I think they're, they need their own category of themselves. Food processing life, I would amend to add that among the impacts to be considered is large truck deliveries. Um, healthcare clinic, amend to exclude maintenance drug dispensary clinic. A maintenance drug dispensary clinic I then define as one a facility in which 60% or more of compensation is based on dispensing of drugs and in which physician examination and treatments on site are accessory to the revenue and dispensary function of the facility. Home occupation, I exclude bed and breakfast, leasing and grooming units, occupations which impact parking and traffic. Definition of hospital, elite health stops, in definition of impervious surface, add any surface that industry standards to determine does not allow water to infiltrate. I know that my colleague is going to take over that issue. I just wanted to get it into the dialogue. Um, incinerator and then delete um, that they're okay if um, energy or fuel resources are recovered. They all say that, um, but it, they're still incinerators. Definition of industrial light, uh, limit to minimal track, truck traffic. Um, oh, kennel residential. It's a new category. You'll be excited to hear about it when we have a chance to discuss it. It's verified. But I have to talk to Councilman Curry first. Um, and then, um, I'm almost done. Uh, inclusion, parks and playgrounds, and then to add where they have pet areas uh, and dedicated off-leash and enclosed pet recreation. We're not turning the whole place into dogs, against dogs. 
I'm sorry, definition of retail goods needs to be broken down to individual categories um, and use conditional. I just put us in as having a role in enacting and um, authorizing use, conditional uses, and reviewing and approving them. Okay, we're done with the definitions, and um, may, we've already talked about the landscape manual. Um, City Council under outline of code administration uh, that I've had that City Council has the power to approve the amendments to the zoning text and maps and to the Baltimore City Landscape Manual. Um, over in uh, where we're at zoning maps and profiles, I've taken I've recommended amending telephone booths and pedestals, uh, take it out of the minute and make it conditional. I'll talk about it later. Open space. Um, I talked about the community managed amendment and adding greenhouses and community garden. I do went back and indeed they are incorporated in the definition, but that's fine. I'm almost done. I only got that much left. Have that much left. Um, I will be amending to include two community gardens right now, home gardens <coughs> and Fox and um, Twenty. 28. Uh, amend to, oh, I want to amend to read from open space uses called cultural facility and plan view development as conditional uses. I want to, um, uh, I don't want them in there at all. I think they're vague and they also suggest development on what we're trying to preserve. Um, I'm amending parking lot to an accessory use, parking structure, accessory use as conditional, and taking out all permitted uses of any kind of the tenants or whatnots, and making them all conditional use on the property by city council. Um, I'm on the last page, this is still open space, um, amending to a 35 maximum height of any structure. Uh, in open space. Now we're in the residential districts, um, which are, which you know what they are. Um, I'm concerned that we have so many districts now because the city may be worried that if you don't nail down certain lot uh, dimensions, that people can subdivide and create two houses where one should be. And I would suggest that we should discuss just plain prohibiting subdivision of property in R1 districts and then consolidate so we don't have so many residential districts. I'm almost done. Permitted and conditional uses under the, um, uh, excuse me, the detached and semi detached, and that's, you know, R1A all the way through R4. Um, Oh, we need to amend so that the permitted use of the conditional uses are divided into the zoning board approved and city council approved. That's not been done. We're amending table 8301 in that case. Amend to delete bed and breakfast up to three rooms as a permitted use. This says conditional. Amend to delete community managed open space and parks and playground as permitted uses list as conditional. Um, who wants to play around next door if you didn't know it was coming? Of course you would, but maybe you'd like a little leverage. Um, amend all other, it's called all other categories of uses, permitted uses in this table, so that to conditional, regardless of size and including stealth design, equipment, and structures. Um, we, we need to carefully review all of these uses. And I uh, finally delete all reference in this table 8-301 to detached dwelling design standards, unless and until those standards come under the control of the zoning code itself in the city council. Okay. okay. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, uh, to, uh, yeah, Councilman Kraft. Um, 
I'd like to ask Ms. Collins a question before we wrap up. Marcia, if I could. I want to follow up on something that Mr. Aylesworth said, because I think it has to do with land use, but it involves another player. Um, and he was talking about Herring Run and the water pipes that run through Herring Run, the emergency water backup that runs through Herring Run, which led me to think about the natural, I think it's a natural gas pipe that runs through the Gwynn's Falls, which I've read about that um, BG&E um, needs to relocate and they need to cut, I don't know how many trees, but take down long-standing forest. Um, I want to know to what degree, through our land use powers in this code or in future code, we can control the actions or limit the actions or divert the actions or whatever of public utilities. Um, and if we can't do that, how we can influence the folks that can so that, um, you know, how do we do that? Can we do it in this? Do we have to do it some other way? Okay, let me see if I can go through all of your issues. As far as the Herring Run example, um, because a lot of our uh, wastewater system is gravity operated, that means you tend to be running in areas where you have the lowest part and usually that's a stream area. So over the years we've had to relocate some of those lines as the stream beds have changed because of uh, you know, all other development that impacts those streams. And so in the particular case of the Herring Run, because we knew we would need to access these lines for maintenance purposes, we tried to do a dual um, purpose by uh, providing a pathway as well, which uh, anyone can use as part of the park activities and which we may use to bring equipment in should we need to maintain. For we do try to work with impacted parties and, and I think that uh, years ago when we were talking about putting in a force main, um, that got adjusted um, as a result of community input that I, I'm sure Ms. Floyd remembers very clearly. Um, city government is a little more um, willing to discuss these opportunities to adjust within the confines of what we have to build. I don't know, uh, a private entity that is providing a service is probably a little step removed from that uh, opportunity. I believe that the issue you're talking about is in the 8th District. I think I've had uh, some Correct. conversations with Councilwoman Holton regarding this issue. Um, that particular instance, I'm not exactly sure, but it is my opinion, and I could be incorrect, but it is my opinion that the running of gas lines are governed by franchises. And as you know, franchises come before city council. So I have not finished my investigation of that particular instance that you bring up, but if it were subject to a franchise, any adjustment to that pathway would require an amendment to the franchise. Is that legislative? Yeah, all our franchises are ordinance driven. So specific to that particular issue you're raising, I am not certain whether that is the case, but we are still checking into that. So if it were governed under a franchise ordinance, then that obviously would come before the council. Okay, now thank they, you. They, BGE may have issues about why they need to place it where they need to place it. That's a separate issue. And can we control all, all of this land use in terms of how we use our parks and what we use our parks for and what we allow in our parks and not allow in, in our parks in this zoning code? I am not a zoning code expert or a land use expert. However, I will say, if we're talking about the antenna issue, 
one of the things we usually bump up against is the, um, the Telecommunications Act, which is a federal law, and there are restrictions. What about paving and parking? That zoning? Yes. We can do that? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, with law, you want to answer law? We, uh, no, it's clear. We good? Okay. Mm -hmm. Doc? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, after all the testimony, we, the, the uh, Land Use and Transportation Committee will recess till the next full hearing when City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning, which will be held on Saturday, October the 3rd at 6.30 p.m. Is that Thursday? What do you have, Saturday? Okay. A typo. It's on the zoning will be held on Thursday, October 3rd at 6.30 p.m. at the Tawanda Community Center located at 4100 Tawanda Avenue. This will be, this will be regards to liquor store nonconformities, Title 18, Subtitle 7, mandatory termination of certain uses, and Title 14, use standards, Title 14-335, retail good establishments with, with liquor sales, and 14-336, taverns will be the topic during this hearing. I want to thank all of you for attending today's Land Use and Transportation Committee hearing, and please check the area around your seat to make certain that you have everything you brought with you. We will be closing the room shortly. Again, thank you.